I'm Annie. And I'm Leah. And this is Lactation Business Coaching with Annie and Leah, where we talk about the smart way to create a compassionate and professional private practice. Let's dive in. Hi there, Annie. Hey there, Leah. How are you? I'm doing great. How about you? I am doing great. I am super excited because we are getting ready tomorrow. We're going to be joined by Chandra Matos, IVCLC for our deeper dive into marketing and business strategy and SEO and all the things that are inside Chandra's amazing brain that I can't wait for her <laughs> to dig them all out <laughs> upon us. And then our next deeper dive is coming up really soon after that on May 11th, we've got Rachel O'Brien coming in to do a deeper dive on educating families about bottles. And I am also super excited about that because that will be kicking off the clinical complexities and supplementing babies conference that is happening live in May and June. And our special awesome guest today, Katie Linda IBCLC is one of our speakers for that conference on supporting second time families when supplementation is indicated. And so we have her here today. Leah, what are we here to talk to Katie about? I'm excited to have Katie because I know that she worked really hard to create an office space that she loves and it was a big journey. And I know Annie and I both know Katie and got to see her through this journey a little bit with posts and questions and things on our kind of social network. So it's really fun to have you here today, Katie. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited. Well, when I was in, in Baltimore in February, visiting my parents and I like to see you when I'm down there, which it had been a while because I hadn't been down there much because of COVID and I was like, I want to see your office, Katie. I've got to see your office. And I met you down there and my jaw was on the floor. It was a magnificent space. Just being in there, it had such a great energy and a great vibe and all your people were there. And it was just, I was like, Katie is living the dream. (laughs) And (laughs) we would love to start out by asking you, Katie, what led you to seek out getting an office space in the first place? It's such a long journey, realistically. (laughs) Years and years ago, I remember being at a conference and someone was talking about the breastfeeding center in DC. And I didn't know that existed, even though it was only an hour from me, but I was a brand new IBCLC. And I was like, oh, this is really cool to have a breastfeeding center where there are, are people and classes and community. And I thought that was a great concept. And I, at that point, decided that I was going to have something like that in Baltimore. And my first step was to register a bunch of domain names so that I was ready when I was ready. But that was about as far as I got at that point, because I was still building my practice and I was still having babies. And it was just more of an undertaking than I was ready for at that time. Years later, I went to a different conference and came home like on fire. I have to do all these things and help all these babies and help all these parents and I need a space. So I set myself out a timeline of when that would happen and what it would look like, where would it be? So I picked the side of town I wanted on. I set the timeline up. And as that time approached, everything was really going fine with home visits. And I wasn't sure I really wanted to add on that extra expense of having an office because rent is a lot and internet and electricity and all the supplies. It's a lot. Yeah. (laughs) So I kind of backburnered that for a couple more months and then COVID hit. And then I realized that COVID wasn't going anywhere. (laughs) But I always was uncomfortable with like flu season and germs. And I remember even talking to my dentist at one point being like, I don't know how you guys even do this with people being sick. Like I have a hard time going from house to house during flu season. Like I'm holding these babies. Do I change my clothes? Like how do I keep these families safe from all these germs that could be coming from other homes? And then COVID just made that exponential. And I realized you know, by August of 2020, that this was just not sustainable. And I could not see multiple families in a day and take germs from one house to the next. And everybody had different levels of concern. So after being at one home visit where I realized that this was it, I went home that night and started looking for office spaces. 
Oh, wow. You know, it's like all the things that have come out of COVID, right? Yeah. Linda's I, amazing office space was like pushed forward because of COVID. That's it really was. It was always my dream. I just didn't have the kick in the butt to spend the money on it. And COVID knows how to kick people in the butt. Let me just sure tell does. you. <laughs> sure does. <laughs> That's its specialty. So I went home that night and searched Craigslist. And then I found a space I thought was going to be amazing. And I sent it to all my friends. I was like, look at this. And I went and I saw it and I really liked it. And I was ready to sign the lease. And my husband was like, you should see some other offices. <laughs> and I was like, but this one's perfect. And he was like, you should see some other offices too. There's not a lack of real estate out there, especially right now. And I was like, but I can afford this one. It was like, Katie. <laughs> so I reached out about another office. And the response back was, that place is leased, but I have another space I'd like to show you. And I was like, I cannot afford that other space. He's like, let me just show you this space. And so that's how I found our office. <laughs> oh, wow. So funny how you look back and you're like, you see how the pieces are falling together, but you're like, why did it have to be so much push and shove and pull? Like I had to be <sighs> persuaded to do this. Wouldn't life be so much easier if we let the, you know, the river just take us down the road, but no, we have to bump into all the rocks along the way. So if you were going to be coaching a new LC, maybe in a similar situation, that's like, yeah, I, I think I want to, to think about an office space. What's something now that you can look back and say, what would be a first step? Like first, first thing to consider before you are out there looking for office spaces? Because I hear you saying like, I can't afford that. That might be something to consider. But what do you think looking back would like, I, I should have considered X first? Because I had been thinking about this for so many years, I think that the biggest things to consider that I've seen other people make mistakes with is accessibility. Are there stairs? Is there a handicapped entrance? What is parking like? How close is it to the highway or other major thoroughfares? If you live in a major city, where is the closest mass transit? Who is your ideal clientele and how are they going to get to you? Is Those are like so many good questions to ask and consider because I feel like accessibility like an ease of getting to you is a huge marketing piece. And if parents think, oh my gosh, I've got to drive around town to this unfamiliar area and roads I've never heard of, and the parking is three blocks away, and then I've got to pay for it. And I mean, there's so many things that we really have to think about, especially like in big cities yeah. where, like you said, people might not have a car and they might need to take public transportation to get to you. I think that's such a smart thing to think about because I, I think probably a lot of people, first thing you think about is the space is pretty and the lighting's nice and I could put a couch right here and people could do laid back breastfeeding on this one. You know, it's like, that might be the first things or like, oh, it has space. I could teach a class or something like that. But like before all that can happen, people got to get to you. <laughs> they got to get in the door. Exactly. But I love that you brought that up because I think that's something that we just don't think about as much because we're looking at like the actual physical space that we're in. I used to definitely classes. something that I had to think of. I thought about with, because I just started in an office and I'm like, it is steps away from the train. And I know there are parking garages because that is the whole point is for me, it wasn't so much about the COVID stuff and not when it was more like, I want to make it easy for people to choose the office. And I was lucky that the office that I'm in, it's on the ground floor. You walk right in. It had been a doctor's office previously. So they already have this full filtration system, like built into the oh, HV. Nice. It was like amazing. Like they're like, yeah, ev like it, it is just all a filter, <laughs> this whole thing. So that was really cool. And I'm sub renting from home birth midwives who are renting from a massage acupuncture place, which is like very cool synergy. I definitely was like, and it's so pretty, but not as pretty as Katie's office. Cause I don't know that anything could be. And I want to have Katie describe for us what her office looks like, what the layout is like. So you're in, I can tell you from like driving up, like I drove up, she gave me parking directions. She had a great little automated text that was like, if you're in the this lot, you're going to go this way. And if you're in this lot, you're going to go this way. You're going to take this elevator, walk to the end of the hallway. Like it was all step by step. And honestly, I needed that because it's a, it's one of those office complexes that you can maybe not even find the door sometimes. And <laughs> 
it so, all looks the same it's a little intimidating and there's not like a main like door person front desk reception area for the whole building so i got in the elevator i walked up and i opened the door and i was like there's a waiting room and there's the little like place where the person is. So tell us about the, you've got the waiting room and you've got the reception area. Tell us about the different treatment rooms that you have and also that common space. And then I have a follow-up question for you about, I want to hear who's in the space with you. All right. So we have our waiting room, which we honestly don't use very much at this point because I don't want there to be many people sitting around and waiting for us. We did make some changes to the layout of the space. It had been a nephrologist's office years ago. So the way that they set up the office was very much small exam rooms and big doctor's offices and a lot of billing space that we just didn't need. So we had them actually tear out all the desks in their like administrative billing area and made that a nice big open room. We hung a TV on the wall in there so that we could do classes and support groups in that space, which I hope we're gonna bring back this summer. Now that I hope that we are on the back end of this pandemic, but it might be a safe choice again. Fingers, Fingers are firmly <laughs> crossed on that one. But we use that space as our weighing the babies, changing the babies and doing the infant exam, because I really love to get moms up and moving and like change pace a little bit. And it's really cool when moms see each other and can say, oh, I remember that stage. Look at that itty bitty little brand new baby you know, here's where we are now. And it's like that nod back to my Lele League roots of getting those connections of parents in different stages where they can connect and support each other. And we've even had people that ran into friends who didn't know they were both there. And then they're like, oh, hey, how are you? Oh, look, you had a baby. Congratulations. They had no idea they were going to run into someone they actually knew, <laughs> but nice. it was super helpful. So I just love getting that like that movement into the visit. So we weigh the babies, we change the babies, and we do the exam out in the big common space. And then we have three smaller rooms. They're not small rooms, but they are what the doctors previously had used as their offices. And those are our main exam rooms. One we sublet out to somebody else who I guess we'll get to in a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then the other two are our lactation rooms. And those have couches that are nice and deep so you can do a sideline nursing position they're also like six feet long so you can lay down on them they are from ikea so they pull out into a futon if you needed to make them a bed which i mean realistically we have a little side table with some like affirmations that i found on etsy to encourage parents and we keep nursing pillows in each room regular bed pillows we keep out underneath the scale and we pull those as needed as well. We've got tissues and sanitizer and plants in each room. That was me on Google searching what plants were best for cleaning the air as we were setting up before vaccines were available for most people. And then the air purifiers because again, like pandemic and also babies. And I just, I don't think we'll ever get rid of the air purifiers even when, it, when we don't technically need them anymore. We have a rolling desk that can be used, that we use to chart on. Some of my team likes to put it across like a real desk. I just use the corners of my laptop on because I don't like a barrier between me and the family. We'll pull in chairs as needed for another parent or another support person or our interns. And they've got this little cart full of like teaching tools and items that we might just need to quickly grab during the visit. So we keep the rooms that. we keep the rooms fairly well stocked, but we do have all the other supplies out in like the main storage areas. And then we have one bigger room that has just some chairs and a massage table set up in there that gets used for a variety of purposes. Um, not mostly lactation, but other things that we provide for parents and we'll use it for lactation if we need to, but that has like a nice, really double one and a half times wide rocking chair that a lot of parents really love, but doesn't quite fit two people on that chair. So then it comes like a little awkward with the seating. So yeah. And then we've got a storage room and a bathroom because the bathroom was a really important thing for me. Yeah. <laughs> you got to have a good bathroom that moms feel comfortable and, um, you know, they, they're already uncomfortable in so many ways. It's nice to have a good space that they can go and use and, 
feel and obviously we need a sink to wash our hands yeah. we ended up with three of those thankfully oh. when we are they in the rooms or are they in oh, your common space there's one obviously in the bathroom and then one is in our biggest exam room which realistically it, that had been two rooms we knocked down a wall to make it a big exam room it had been like a lunch room and an office mm. for the old providers but we decided that we really need at least one room with a sink in it for long-term growth and then because it already was a physician's office before we got there, there is like what I call like the lab area, you know, like where mm -hmm. you would process your analysis and things like that. And there's a sink in that area as well. Nice. So, um, and Sounds then, like a great setup. It really is. And when we were looking at spaces within this building, the realtor was like, but we can put a sink in anywhere, but a bathroom costs $20,000. And I was like, find me a bathroom <laughs> because I'm not having parents walk who knows how far to the bathroom. And yeah, outside of your space. Us, yeah. With them. What does that even look like? Certainly not everyone's going to be as fortunate <laughs> and luck into a space that has a toilet. We had some problems with the toilet when we first moved in. And the maintenance guy was like, at least the bathrooms are right outside. And I was like, yeah, but like you have parents who just gave birth and are they going to hold it and like risk a UTI or something? Are they going to leave their newborn with us That's virtual strangers? Thing. Yes, right? yes. Or are they going to take their baby into a gross public restroom? Like right? I know the bathrooms in the building are clean and they're well cared for, but it's still a public restroom and it's still your brand new baby. Yeah, I'm so, so grateful in our office space. Like literally you open the door and the bathroom is right across the hall. So parents like are often like can leave their baby right there and like literally could hear everything. So it's super nice. I am so grateful that we have that bathroom closed off in our little space right next to our exam rooms, because I do feel so bad for parents because it's like those first times I know I did this, like you're out at the doctor's office. You're like, I've got my baby and I got to go to the bathroom. What do you do? Like, how do you make it through that? Especially because I used to baby wear. So then I'm like, oh, I got the baby on my body. Can I go to the bathroom? time. I don't know how to work that out. So that's awesome that you were able to luck upon a space like that. I think that's a real value to it. I was just curious as you've worked through and had people come through and been in the space for a while, like some kind of high level design tips to consider. Obviously we talked about the bathroom is a great design tip. Is there anything else that kind of stands out? Yeah, we actually changed this because it worked so much better to do it this way or something that you put into place that you really like that feels like a good design tip if you're going to give it to somebody else. The flooring was really important to me. They were like, what carpet do you want? And I was like, no, no carpet, <laughs> please. <laughs> we have breast milk and we have a spit up. And I tell this story a couple of times now. We had a family who the new dad put the diaper on and it wasn't quite on well. And so mom finished nursing the baby and he's, what is that on your, oh my God. And there was poop coming out of the diaper all over mom. Oh and no picks up the baby and he carries the baby to the changing table and it's like poop dripping the whole way <laughs> and oh I gosh. am dying this is hilarious I am cracking up dad is mortified mom is mortified I'm like it's wipeable floor this yeah. is no big deal let me grab a cavi wipe and a tissue and I'll get the dirt up and then I'll get the germs up this is totally fine yes uh, I can only imagine if we had carpet <laughs> oh <laughs> gosh how much cleaning would have yeah. involved I know one of the things that I, we, we searched long and hard for was wipeable couches. So they're faux yes. leather, but that has saved us like from all the things, poop, milk, spit up, and everything like, has really been on that couch. Couches. Because the ones that my husband really would liked were also faux leather because I was at Ikea and I knew that's what I needed, but they had buttons. He's like, oh, they're so yeah, attractive. No. And I was like, but that's going to gather spit there. up and poop. Yeah. And I know. That is such um, a good thing. And I think your design tip, I just want to point out about like maybe creating some kind of common space, maybe beyond a waiting room, but some common space that, that people might be passing each other or having some interactions. I think that was something else to highlight that you have found to be that really valuable. Movement helps with the learning I mean, it was one of the things that I learned years ago when I was working on my prenatal breastfeeding class and even my like pumping class, I actually had someone reach out to me after they had a not so great prenatal class that they took and they were an education designer at a college. 
Oh, wow. And they were like, let me talk to you about how to make your class, make your classes better because I was really disappointed with the class I took elsewhere. And one of the things that she really talked about was the amount of movement that helps you learn and retain information. Mm. And if you're just sitting and it's monotonous, you're not going to retain all of that. And so moving around helps people re retain the information. <laughs> That's really interesting. That's a really good like tip for all of us, not just about building the space out, but like even when you do your classes, yes. don't forget about this piece of adult learning that yeah. is just so valuable. We have similar setup in that like we have our scale and everything outside of the exam rooms. And I do love it. Again, it kind of breaks up the visit. So we're moving and I don't know, it just feels better than if we're sitting in this enclosed space, which they're big, but they're not huge rooms for such a long time. It's like that in and out and get everybody up and moving. And it's nice. I can pull the partner in to be like, okay, you know, take a break parent. We're going to go and weigh the baby. And so just, I don't know, it, I've really found it to be such a valuable way to set up at those rooms where you don't have the scale in the room with you. I'm sure there's plenty of pros about that as well, but that that's communal space feels really nice. And our waiting space, we get a lot of cross traffic because we're in a pediatric office and the amount of like I walk in there and they're all like communing over oh my gosh we were just there you're gonna make it everything's gonna be fine I just love it so much because I'm like thank you for showing this like parent to parent support just feels so good and I love that you're also seeing that in your space too it's so important yes it is and we Especially forget about that and during the pandemic, it's like, for a long time, we didn't have anybody in waiting rooms, but we're just now getting that back. And it's just been warming my heart because almost every time I go to pick up my client, they're like having a sweet conversation with the parent next to them, encouraging them. Because newborns, you know what I think one talk to you. <laughs> You also did something design-wise that was really about that sense of community that both of you are talking about. You have a very special piece of art in your main area. Can you tell us about it? As I was dreaming of my space years ago, I actually applied for a program in a different part of town where they were like giving you the first year free rent to revitalize this neighborhood. And so I started like really drawing out my thoughts and dreams at that point of what the space would look like. And one of my foundational pieces was the art. And Lauren Turner is a local doula, birth advocate, and artist. And if you can see around me, you'll see that like the painting behind my head is one that I had her do that we did for a Mother's Day card two years ago. And then I've got some of her postcards framed around as well. And so I knew that I really wanted Lauren's art in our waiting room to really showcase Black maternal health, um, to help moms feel like they were welcome in our space. And it's really been a conversation point for a lot of families as they come in and they see the bodies that look like theirs. And they feel welcome and accepted. And it's really powerful and meaningful to me that we're able to support a local artist and a local mom, but also have art that depicts what we're about in the space. And so there's some pregnant bellies, there's a person using an SNS, there's a nursing mom in this beautiful pink gown. There's five pieces of main art in the waiting room that all kind of depict that piece of art, but from a woman of color perspective. And then I just commissioned a new piece that I have yet to hang, but it's going to be, but it is amazing that I'm super duper excited about that is people from all kinds of backgrounds and different ways of feeding their babies and baby wearing and bottle feeding and breastfeeding and music and SNS. And there is a masculine presenting parent chest feeding the baby. And there are moms with head coverings and there is a parent in a wheelchair and just really trying to encompass the foundation of what we're about is like supporting all families and meeting families where they are and trying to work within our biases to serve all the families that need us because we all have some biases, but trying to back burner that to make sure that we are being the best that we can be for the families who need our supports. I love that. If you're listening, may be familiar with Lauren Turner's artwork and you just don't know it. It's being featured on the cover of 
USLCA's journal this year, they're going to, all their covers are artwork by Lauren Turner. So I think you would see it. And this piece, I've seen your pictures of this piece and we'll we'll try to get it for people watching to see how it's really beautiful. And you can tell like the love that went into it. It wasn't commissioned just to be like a piece of corporate art. It was like, there was a dream behind it. And it was a dream that you incubated so many years ago. And I also love that it's a local artist. That's somebody from your community and there's so much meaning and so many layers there. And back to the other providers that are in your office, because that is how you have this dream of not just providing lactation, but really supporting the birthing families in Baltimore. So tell us about who else is working with you. I knew that when we had an office, I was going to need to have something, some reason. (laughs) to come to us instead of us going to families. I felt like there needed to be like some big difference. And so the point we were in the office, there were two of us, we were two IBCLCs and we needed a bigger space, obviously with two of us doing visits, but I needed to also bring in some other team members. So at the time there was a birth center that had unfortunately just closed. And I knew that several of their midwives were not working anywhere else yet. So I reached out to one and I was like, listen, I've got this dream. I'm about to sign this lease. Like I'm looking for spaces. Here's what I'm thinking. Will you walk this journey with me and figure out what this is going to end up being? And she said, I love your passion. I love your ideas. I don't know this is a long-term plan for me because I do want to go back to doing births, but I would love to help you get this started and figure out what the job really looks like. And Melissa joined me and we went through the path of figuring out how to set up a clinic where we had a nurse midwife as our medical director, so to speak. I live in a state where a NP of any sort, whether it's a CNM or a family nurse practitioner or any other of the specialized nurse practitioner roles are independent providers. So they do not need a physician oversight to operate. So with our nurse midwife, we are able to be in network with all the major insurances, and that allows us to bill for our lactation visits, but we can also use her skills to better support the community. So Melissa had a passion for helping support families through like family planning, through postpartum, and just helping moms get a handle on how to handle postpartum. And when it was time for her to transition, we hired a midwife who has her postpartum mental health certification and is actually finishing up her clinicals for her psych NP as well. Oh, wow. So so Helen is able to talk to families, talk to parents, help them manage how they're feeling postpartum, prescribe meds if that's acceptable or not acceptable, if that's the right choice for that situation. So also order labs if we need to order labs from milk supply standpoint or from mental health standpoint. We do a lot of like, how is your vitamin D and how is your thyroid? If those are off, you're not going to feel good. Yeah. Uh, so it really gives us this rounded ability to order labs, to prescribe medications when that's the right answer for the family and to be able to bill insurance in that setting for the lactation as well as the mental health and some breastfeeding medicine stuff as well. That's so awesome. I love that you really saw this need and like you figured out how to fill it and pulled in the right people to make that happen. I think that's so neat. And it's really great to hear how that allowed you to reach more families and also became a draw to have families come to you because I know it's always a little scary going into the office because you're thinking everybody's not going to, they want to keep the home visits. They're not going to want to come see me. And I feel like I need to coax them in. Like, I promise you'll love my office. Just give it a try. But you figured out a way that like, Hey, it just makes sense to come to the office. It just makes sense. And this is why from many different aspects of that. But I think that's really neat that you figured out a way. That's how, what we always do. We're figuring out a way around, (laughs) work around this situation So our last kind of wrap up question we can do really quickly is just if you could go back in time and maybe whisper something in the ear of past Katie, some piece of wisdom or advice or, Hey, just chill out. It's fine. (laughs) What would be like, if you went back and looked back, what would be the thing that you would whisper in past Katie's ear? I think there are two things. One is that the bureaucracy takes way longer than you expect. So start on the paperwork side of things way earlier. I waited till I had keys in hand 
to work on getting malpractice insurance that covered the midwife. And because I thought I needed the physical address first, and I really mm. didn't, I didn't need to have that. And I did not realize that, that was going to be a humongous piece. All the insurance time crap took months. It was months of us just with our lactation liability, seeing families while I paid the midwife to do paperwork for us because she couldn't actually do anything. So that was like three months we wasted, honestly, that we should have started earlier and gotten that taken care of because then we also could have started on the insurance credentialing earlier. But I, again, thought we need a physical address for that. And I thought that the malpractice insurance would take the same like 90 seconds it does for lactation. <laughs> Had no idea. So it was really like six to eight months of us being in that office before we were really mm. set up, which was definitely a financial strain because paying the bills when you don't have the money coming in is really challenging. Yeah. <laughs> so I highly recommend doing as much of the paperwork ahead of time as you possibly can and hire an admin before you actually need one. Oh, yes. Because yeah. when you wait until you are up to your eyeballs in paperwork and losing your mind, you don't have the bandwidth to make that happen. So bringing your team on as you start to think that maybe you might need somebody else <laughs> is a much better bet than waiting until you are at your breaking point and need somebody else because you'll have more time to choose the right person and you'll also have the time to get them settled in the role versus waiting until you're drowning. Um, and surround yourself with good people. Find the right team that shares your same common goals of whatever those are. For us, it was making sure that we were providing an inclusive space. We even went as far as changing the business name to make sure that our name was inclusive when we opened. So just making sure that you're finding the people who are going to support those same common goals that you have, which is obviously easier when you have time versus our scrambling. I think that's good advice with or without an office. Things do Absolutely. take longer than you think they're going to surround yourself with the right aligned people, have a vision and really stick to it. And I love all this advice that you're giving. I'm super intrigued and inspired by just what you've done. It really is. I don't know, because sometimes it's hard to see when you're on the inside of it, like the way you are doing your business every day, but from the outside, it really is incredible. It's a great thing that you're doing. And I hope that people listening can be inspired by what you've done and, and dream those dreams and visions. And dream big. I mean, we took a space on that realistically was bigger than I thought I needed. I was like, there's no way I need this whole space. Like the other space I looked at originally had two exam rooms, a waiting room, a reception area, and then a bigger meeting room. And honestly, we would have already outgrown that space. But in the process of going, do I really need a space this big? Oh, what am I going to do with all this space? I had a physical therapist who specializes in like pelvic health reach out to me and say, hey, I need an office because the clinic I'm working in is just too open. We've got to shut the whole place down if I have a pelvic PT patient. Do you know of anyone looking to sublet? And I was like, actually... <laughs> How about sign the lease? Let's talk. And that really gave me the confidence that with that part of the rent taken care of, because she was going to take on that room, it was less scary for me. So think about long-term when you're signing a corporate lease, that's going to be multi multiple years and think about what other businesses you can bring in, other services you can offer to really get a well-rounded space to make sure that families are getting as much support as possible in one location, which is going to then just build upon, right? Like our PT gets referrals from us. We get referrals from her. She does ultrasound therapy for clogged ducts, which is super amazing. And she knows how important it is because she sees the day in, day out. So she often will squeeze them in the next day for us when needed. So having those other supportive collaborative businesses on site can be really powerful in making sure that families have access to the care and support they need all in one place. It's easy to get to when it's all together and it's comfortable and accessible. So amazing. Katie, it has been 
awesome having you on the podcast today. And I just want to invite all of you to come to our next deeper dive, sign up for clinical complexities and supplementing babies. And you'll get the deeper dive in May with Rachel O'Brien about educating families about bottles. You'll get to hear Katie talk about how to support families when they're having their next baby number two, baby number three, baby number eight. Katie is putting together a great presentation for us about that. And until next time, Thank you so much, Katie and Leah. It was always great podcasting with you. Thank you, Katie. Thanks for having me, guys. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening. To learn more about our monthly deeper dives and how to support our podcast for as little as $1 a month, visit lactationbusinesscoaching.com. Don't forget to leave us a rating and hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode.